Good morning. So glad that all of you are joining us today. Russell and I are really sorry that we cannot be there with you today, but we are so excited to be able to go see our new newest granddaughter. So thank you for allowing us the opportunity to go and the opportunity to do this Sunday's lesson online. I pray that each of you uh, are having a good week. Uh, my prayer is that God will tremendously bless each of you. And uh, please, uh, sometime, either today or tomorrow or uh, sometime soon, please email Louise your prayer requests. I love getting those prayer requests um, and praying for you and with you um, all week. So please do that. Uh, because I look forward to getting those emails uh, from her on Sundays. Uh, so please do that. But for now, let's go ahead uh, and let's gather together in prayer. Oh, Father God, how grateful we are that even though we are not together physically, But Father, we can still unite. And it is only because of you that we can do that. Father, I'm grateful for technology that allows us to still, Lord, hear a word from you, even when we can't physically be there. And Father, I am just so grateful that Lord, even when we're apart, that prayer is just a wonderful and magnificent thing. So thank you. And Father, right now I do lift up every person in our Bible study group and every person that's li listening right now. I pray, Father, that whatever their prayer requests are, that your hand will be on them, Lord. And I do pray for blessings. Father, that you send your blessings to each of us. And more importantly, I pray that we will notice what those blessings are. Father, I just want to... To, Father God, just lift us all up. We live in such uncertain times, Father, particularly with COVID that is ravaging the world. And Father, I just uh, pray, Father, that you will bless those that are on the front lines of that. You'll give them strength, Lord, to, to carry on and wisdom to know how to deal with each and every single person that comes their way. And Father, for those that are ill, whether it be COVID, whether it be cancer, or just a common cold, Father, I pray for your healing. I pray, Father, that, Lord, their bodies will become whole again father sometimes we realize that your healing is is that we succumb to the illness and father we know that there is no greater joy than to be with you so father for those that are left behind I pray for them for comfort and for peace Father, I pray for our first responders. You will protect them in all that they do. Military, police, firemen, and whomever else, Lord. I just pray as they protect us. and I just pray, Lord, that you will protect them. And Father, for those that lead our, lead our country, from our president, 
vice president, to our Supreme Court justices, Lord, to our congressmen, Lord, to governors and mayors and city council people, Father, that make decisions that, Lord, affect people. First and foremost, I pray that they seek you. But I pray for your wisdom and your guidance. And Father, us as your children, Lord, fellow believers, as Father, has people that are called by your name, I pray, Father, that you too will guide us. Show us, Father, the way in which we should live. Show us, Father, the things that you would have us to do and to say. Father, may we be the salt and the light. May we be that reflection in a mirror of you. And now, Father, as we go in to study your word, I pray that our minds and our hearts are set on you. We will hear from you and we will listen. We love you, Father God, and we thank you for all that you do for us. And I pray, Father, that next week you will bring us safely all together again. For it is in your name. Amen. Hello, class. Uh, as promised, uh, we are streaming today, and so it's good to see you. And uh, without further ado, uh, we're going to move on into our lesson. And so... Uh, wanting to uh, just go ahead and transition us over here to a different screen where you can see me uh, in the corner. Full screen lesson. There we go. Uh, and so I think this is me transitioning over. And so uh, let's, uh, let's give this a shot. I tried to record this last night and then realized I had no sound. And uh, while there are some who say I'm better that way, uh, let's just say that uh, I uh, thought differently. And so um, that being said, let's kind of start on in with the lesson uh, as we planned. And we stopped here uh, in our lesson last week where Paul was falsely accused uh, by the Jews of attempting to carry um, a, a, a Gentile into the court of the Jews, which is illegal. It's it's a death sentence, uh, and uh, it would be uh, very very. Uh, and on top of that, as usual, uh, he was uh, accused, and the riot broke out when they brought him to the Sanhedrin. Uh, they brought all sorts of accusations, thinking that they could, you know, forego. Uh, all of the legal maneuvers and uh, and convict him right there. When the Romans saw this, the Romans intervened and took Paul into what effectively is protective custody. And uh, when that was um, was learned by uh, somebody on the inside, Paul's sister's Paul's nephew, Paul's sister's son. I don't know why the text goes so far as to. <clears throat> to say that, but Paul uh, was trans was uh, that that plot was discovered. Paul alerted uh, the um, the the governor of the area at the time, and uh, and they took him under uh, protective custody and uh, down to Caesarea, and that way they thwarted the plot to kill Paul. And this is really the second time. Uh, that there's been a plot, but uh, we ended there with the soldiers carrying out this order, uh, and they put a heavy 
um, a heavy group around him, uh, Calvary, and, uh, and they delivered him uh, to Governor Felix in, uh, and uh, in, the, um, in Herod's palace at Caesarea. So when the governor motion, and at this point, uh, five days later, Paul is being tried before uh, Felix, the governor. It says, after five days, uh, the high priest Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer. Ah, we've always got to have a lawyer. Tertullus. Tertullus. And they brought their charges against Paul before the governor. Uh, when Paul was called in, Tertullus presented his case before Felix. There are some things that we'd recognize that, uh, that the accused has the right to face his accusers. These are things uh, that would be just as true in our courts as they were then. Uh, and there's a certain decorum of the atmosphere. Uh, when Paul was called in, Tertullus presented his case before Felix. And he starts with, we have enjoyed a long period of peace under you. Okay, that's a lie. Uh, Tertullus was well known for having taken, de uh, dealt hard, dealing harshly uh, on a number of occasions with different people. Um, and that includes uh, the original assumption that Paul was the terrorist that was, uh, was leading an insurrection. And so they know darn well that Felix uh, is not a, a peaceful person. Um, uh, he goes on to say, and your foresight has brought about reforms of the nation, of this nation. Of course, that's untrue by history standpoint. Uh, even Josephus has very little to say about uh, Felix's accomplishments. Uh, and then he's, he goes on in verse 3, everywhere and every way, most excellent Felix, we acknowledge this with profound gratitude. But in order not to worry you any further, I would request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. So, he's kind of poured it on deep at this point. Uh, and, and that wouldn't have been uncommon for a, an experienced rhetorician. Tertullus uh, is a, uh, a Roman name. Uh, and it, it, uh, it would be a variant of some other Greek names. Uh, and uh, either he is a Roman hired by the Jews or he is a Greek-speaking Greek Jew like Paul. And so uh, he was an, an attorney that was most likely there uh, on behalf uh, of the Jews in the area. And these kind of speeches uh, were very, very common. So, uh, you know, Tertullus presents his case. And, uh, and so he goes on and he says, We have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. And I want you to keep that perspective in mind because he's under a jurisdiction here. He's not being tried for his reputation in other places. But the accusation tells you something about the nature of his accusers. He said, he is the ringleader of a Nazarene sect. And even, this is important, he even tried to desecrate the temple. So we seized him. Now, they've gone from outright accusing him of desecrating the temple, which is a death penalty uh, offense, to trying to do that. Not a death penalty offense. He also refers to a Nazarene sect. And that would be the equivalent of saying it's a cult. Uh, it's not legitimate uh, Judaism. And, and so he, he, he accuses Paul of being a ringleader. Oddly enough, Jesus is the ringleader. And, there, and by this time uh, in history, um, some 20 years after, or, or more after the fact, uh, it's well known that the Nazarene was Jesus and that the cult, as they called it, the sect, uh, is uh, about Jesus. 
and so they've kind of understated who he is, where he's from, and then they they put they nuanced their charge because un, they didn't expect to be in this situation. They expected to ambush Paul along the way and dispense with him, and that's the end of Paul. But Paul has appealed to his Roman citizenship, and the power is no longer in their hands. Uh, verse seven. By examining him yourself, you will learn. Uh, you'll be able to learn the truth about all these charges we're bringing against him. Uh, and then the other Jews uh, join in the accusation, asserting that these things were true. And so, what we have is essentially a smaller mob of people who took the time to take a 60-mile journey from Jerusalem downhill. To Caesarea, and uh, they've gone essentially from the place where they're in power in Jerusalem down to the area where the Romans are in power, and it's largely Jewish down around the uh, the, the plains and the coastland. And so now they they don't have a mob on their behalf, and uh, and they have nuanced their charges against him, uh, hoping to keep at least. The, um, the structure of the case that they have against uh, Paul uh, intact, but at the same time knowing that they are accountable to Roman law uh, for the results. And so when the governor motioned to Paul to speak, Paul replied. And his, listen to his, uh, how different it, his, uh, his view of the situation is from the lawyer. Uh, when the governor moved, Paul replied, I know uh, that for a, num for a number of years you have been a judge over this nation, so I gladly make my defense. And, uh, and, and that's it. Uh, n no platitudes, uh, no, um, no uh, you know, sucking up to the judge. Um, he, he's straight to the point. In fact, what he does actually do is he is brief. Uh, and, and what he says, he says, you can, in verse 11, you can easily verify that no more than 12 days ago, I went up to Jerusalem to worship. And my accusers did not find me arguing with anyone in the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogues or anywhere else in the city. They cannot prove to you the charges they are now bringing against me. And therein is um, a little hint uh, of what he's going towards. He says, uh, however, this is true, and this is my, that's what my words, however, I admit that I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way, uh, which they call a sect. What Paul just did there, and, and lest you overlook it, uh, because there are modern scholars who believe that Paul really did preach against the law. And the term for that is antinomian, that he was against the law. But, uh, but what he did just tell you right there is that there is a clear stream from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And in Paul's mind, uh, the God of their ancestors, which is Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, the law, and the prophets are equally legitimate for him as are the, uh, the rituals of the Jewish religion for him and that the sect, as the Jews call it, the way, uh, is nothing more than a continuance of Judaism. And so it is, the, as Jesus described it, the fulfillment of of the law uh, that he is preaching. And he said, um, I believe everything that is in accordance with the law that and that it was it is written by the prophets. So and I hope the same hope I have the same hope in God as these men have that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. And at that point, what, what he tells them is that my difference 
Uh, and, and the whole problem that we have here is that we had a theological difference back in Jerusalem. And that's it. There, there was no riot. There was no, uh, outro uh, there was no outrage, no, uh, nothing that could potentially be uh, perceived as a death sentence. And, um, and that in, in many ways he considers himself to be one of them, even though they themselves have declared um, Christianity and the way as, um, as a sect. Uh, another way of saying it is he belongs to that Nazarene's cult up, you know, out in the country. And that's all he is. And Paul says, no, I belong to their religion just like they do. And, um, and I believe everything that they believe. And the, the problem that we have is that I believe in a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked, which... Uh, clearly puts him against the Sadducees and on the side of most Pharisees, and that would uh, that would cause a problem. That would cause uh, a stirring of the crowd. After an absence of several years, Paul, verse 17, I came to Jerusalem to bring my people gifts for the poor and to present offerings. Now hold on to that thought because we're coming back to it. I was ceremonially clean when they found me in the temple courts doing this. Um, there was no crowd with me, uh, nor was I involved in any disturbance. But there are some Jews from the province of Asia who ought to be here before you and bring charges if they have anything against me. Or these who are here should state what crime they found in me that I stood before the Sanhedrin. Unless it was this one thing I shouted out as I stood in their presence, uh, that being uh, it is concerning the resurrection of the dead, that I'm on trial for you today. So, in as in our court, if uh, the accusers don't show up to the trial, it's a mistrial. Uh, no witnesses, no crime. And what Paul tells you is uh, that when the Jews in Ephesus found out that, J that Paul wanted to go to Jerusalem uh, for the Passover, uh, they hopped on a boat to meet him there. It gives you an indication that all the way between Asia and Galatia and uh, Macedonia, uh, that that Paul was indeed being followed by a group of people who were intent on uh, making uh, on on silencing him, on putting him out of the mix, uh, and and so with them not being there, uh, the the trial is over. The motions have been dismissed, and and that's the way it should have worked. Uh, in our courts, that's the way it would work. Um, and so they have no case. In fact, Paul goes on to say, the only disturbance that I'm involved in is that I was part of a disagreement between the Sadducees and the Pharisees uh, and uh, about the resurrection of the dead. And you have no witnesses, you have no case, you have no content. Then Felix, in verse 22, then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. That means that Felix already knows the problem, and he knows that this is just about Jewish theology. When Felix, who was well acquainted with the Jews, he adjourned the proceedings. When Lysias, the commander, comes, he said, I will decide your case. Uh, and he ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. Um, there, there's two things important here. Lysias, the commander, is the only really true eyewitness to what happened with Paul. And he's the one that found out about the plot and, uh, and made sure uh, that, uh, that Paul was given safe passage uh, down to Rome. And now Paul is staying as, I, and I don't want to call it prison, it's more like house arrest. You could call it protect, protective custody. Uh, but on top of that, 
he's given enough freedom so that if Paul has some people on the outside, they can uh, attend to his needs, and he can walk freely among uh, the uh, the castle that Herod built in Caesarea. And, and this will be the case for much of Paul's imprisonment. Uh, he is on one hand free, but on another hand, uh, he's, uh, he's under custody and he's being uh, held um, you know, for, uh, for his own safety and because Roman law uh, dictates it. Uh, the Felix is just accountable to Roman law as is Paul and the Jews, and Paul knows what his rights are. And so at this point, he's exercising his rights and, uh, and so he, he doesn't even have to bribe the guards to get him food because the Romans probably wouldn't have provided him food. When they had somebody in custody, they didn't provide food for them. They didn't see any point in that. So Paul's needs are taken care of, and he lives under relative freedom. Several days later, uh, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. Let's talk about uh, Drusilla. Uh, that's Felix's third wife. He's the daughter of Herod Agrippa the one. So there's Herod Antipas, then there's Herod Agrippa, and then there's Herod Agrippa number two. Uh, at age 15, she married another king, a uh, king of Emesa, uh, and, and relatively insignificant, but she deserted that king for Felix. And, uh, and her son actually was killed in the eruption of Vesuvius in 79. So at the very early age, she has already married two very important men. Uh, over the years, uh, Felix had married three different princesses. Most of the, the lasting ma with marriage was with the most long lasting marriage was with, uh, with Drusilla. And uh, so he had to convince her to divorce King Amasa. This is the kind of stuff that really was frowned on by the Romans, of a, a person in a position of authority. By the way, Drusilla is from uh, Sicilia also, which is where Tarsus is located. And, and it, it was just, um, it was not well thought of for, um, for a leader to marry, um, a, you know, someone under his, um, under his leadership. Uh, and so he and his wife, Drusilla, it was common in that time for uh, people to, to bring in uh, sages. Uh, it wasn't at all unlike the situation uh, where uh, uh, Herod Antipas brought in John the Baptist and to, to hear what he had to say. He was a person of authority, who taught with authority, uh, who had something important to say. And so uh, Paul uh, was brought before Her uh, Drusilla and Felix, uh, and, uh, and they listened to him as he spoke about Jesus Christ. So he's familiar with the way, Drusilla's familiar with who they are. They want to at least, I don't know, entertain uh, some new thing that was, uh, that was becoming significant under his leadership. Uh, there is one other thing that you need to understand, which is that Felix is truly accountable to Ananias. Uh, Ananias had complained about Felix's predecessor, and the Romans uh, uh, unseated him or called him back. Um, you know, they overthrew him, but they even killed uh, his predecessor's secretary. So Felix understands that if he is unapproved of, uh, by the Romans in the way that he handles this, he could be in trouble. And if he doesn't, uh, if he doesn't meet the needs of the Jews, he's in trouble. And so, in both respects, um, Felix is in a in a really difficult spot. So he wants to hear who this guy is, and he spoke about Jesus. And in verse 25, as Paul talked about righteousness self-control and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, that's enough, mate, but for now. 
you may leave. Uh, I find when I find it convenient, I'll send for you. At the same time, he was probably thinking that Paul still had money left over uh, from his his uh, his offerings for the poor in Jerusalem. So he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe. So he sent for him frequently and talked with him. So it's not unlike when John the Baptist told uh, Herod, uh, uh, Herod Antipas that he, was, he shouldn't be sleeping with his brother's wife or his ex-wife. Um, this is the same situation. There's a conviction here. It also tells you that Paul really knew who Felix was. He knew Felix's heart. He wasn't afraid right to Felix's face uh, to to judge him, uh, to, to, to talk about righteousness and self-control and things that clearly Felix did not live in his own life. And so uh, this is the kind of boldness and the kind of assertiveness that was the case for, for, for John the Baptist, for Jesus, and for, uh, and for Paul uh, to be able to stand up in front of powerful people and speak the truth. Uh, verse 27, when two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews. He left Paul in prison. I can only imagine what the conversations were with uh, Felix and his advisors about how to split the difference between his obligations to Roman law on one hand and his political threat posed by Ananias and the chief priest in Jerusalem. And, uh, and, and he stayed in this protective custody for a very long time until Felix had departed. And Now, it, this was a dangerous situation because the old guy is gone and the new guy has come in, but many things haven't changed. And, and that's kind of where I want to stop this lesson. I'm sorry, it's a little bit short. But um, to think about the fact that, you know, that whenever we depend, as it were, on, our, uh, on, on, a, on the law, on the secular law, and on politicians who enforce it, uh, there's a certain risk that, uh, that those people really aren't our friends. And the Romans really were not Paul's friends. This particular situation worked out well for Paul. Uh, we know that he had the same kind of friends in Ephesus because they basically came up and said, you've got to get out of here. You can't continue to go down and speak with these crowds. And, and it's also clear that the Jews who thought Paul was going for uh, the Passover had already gotten there. They got there uh, maybe days before the Passover. That means that by this time, they'd been uh, in Jerusalem for at least 50 days because Paul didn't get there until Pentecost. And, and so they had to go home. And for everything that they pursued Paul, Paul delaying from going for the Passover to going to Pentecost put them in a position where they couldn't continue to fall through on their charges with Paul. I'm reminding you, add my confirmation flight. Thank you, Alexa. We got it. Okay, so... Sorry, I'm not sure. Of course you're not. You're I'm reminding you. And I'm turning you off. <laughs> Such is my life. Well, she interrupted my my last thought here. Is, you know, we need to be careful uh, about depending on people in positions of power. Uh, and, and for that matter, politicians. And I, I count uh, the Jews, the, the high priest, uh, as politicians, people who had been in positions of power that were married to religion. And that's, if, if there's one single thing that the framers of our Constitution did, is they listened to to religious people, many Baptists, who said, we don't want the Congregationalists or the Presbyterians 
uh, to make laws that preclude our freedom to worship. And that's where that came from, this so-called separation of church and state. It, it came from the fact that we've learned over centuries that if you marry religion and politics, and this is true not only in the Catholic, uh, uh, Roman Catholic Church, but even with some Protestant reformers like John Calvin and Martin Luther and Ulrich Zwingli, uh, and for that matter, the Anglican Church in England, there had always been a problem where one religious group would persecute another. And, and, and so politics and our faith have never been friends with one another. And we need to make sure that we ourselves make, and know that we answer first to God and to our conscience. And, and, and then and only then are we accountable uh, also to the laws of the land. And in Paul's case, this worked really well now. But we know later on. It won't work so well with Paul because ultimately the politicians and the people in power will cru will crucify. They will kill Paul. So that's that's the biggest thing. I know that many of us are struggling with where the world is going at this point. And if there's any one thing I can get out of this particular lesson, is that you know our faith is first and foremost in Jesus. Uh, irrespective of who is the president, and so um, I. Uh, that being said, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of end right here. But um, I do want to tell you that I'm looking forward to being back. I hope Harry has worked out a way where everyone in the class, those who want to stay home and those who want to meet in purpose in person, can have their needs met. And I want to commit to you that I'm going to make that happen for our class. Uh, with Harry, we're going to work together to see if we can have something where we're live together. And if we can't in in in, in the short term, uh, I will make sure that we get lessons in front of you. And so, uh, let's say a quick prayer, and uh, and then we'll call it a, a morning. Uh, Father, I pray that uh, you would take care of our class. Uh, keep us safe, keep us healthy, Father, and keep us focused on you. Uh, let us go now to worship, uh, in, and let us worship you in spirit and truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so uh, I hope that I, I look forward to being back uh, while Mary is going to uh, be in Omaha taking care of our grandbaby and uh, so I hope you all have a good day and uh, we can't wait to see you soon